that, now in that, a dry sump system, a dry sump system is it's nicer because <laughs> you're on a fixed yeah. system and it's basically pulling to a given pressure and you know that and you have you know pressure increase well then something's escaping that's not supposed to be there you know crack a piston or massive right. blow by on a ring or it's not pumping or or the other ones you might just have a crack in something in a valve cover or something that simple but you know develop yeah. a leak but yep um i guess you know what since you brought it up what is your opinion of the necessity of a dry sump on a Subaru engine for a race car not for a street car uh, I'd, for, I'd for a street car it doesn't make sense i don't it, think I would say it would depend on your level of race car. Um, I'm currently building my coupe to run in grid life street mod. Um, and I plan on it being a wet sump. Mm -hmm. You'll see people that preach dry sump. Uh, I also look at the existing wet sumps. and know that there's room for improvement on all of the ones that are on the market. Um, so I'll be working on my own, you know, oil sump for my car. And if it's cost effective, people want it, then it might come out as a three of my product, but otherwise it's going on my car and, I'll test and evaluate. And I have a couple of guys who I know want it, mm -hmm. you know, close friends who want to test it on their race cars. So great race car friends have race car friends. So, yeah. Always. Um, yeah. So I, I've got a few wet sumps bits coming out um, because I think for most people buying a dry sump, if it's not necessary is a massive expense that I don't think a lot of guys at the Subaru level are at in terms of needing so long as they actually take care of the wet sump system itself. And the other thing is, yeah, a dry sump system can add power if done properly. Most people don't have the, I'll say the tools necessary to make it advantageous to go ahead and make power for you going and spending four grand. So basically it's, you know, four or five grand, if not more in terms of just insurance. Sure. Um, I would say a properly set up wet sump system and um, we'll take your pick of, I'll say, uh, oil uh, insertion systems, okay. if you will. Yeah. to uh, go ahead and be a Band-Aid. So. Sure. Well, see, I think my opinion on it is that it's, I, I would I would play devil's advocate there and say that it's more important for even like mid-tier Subaru race cars and up because of the reliability that it brings in terms of oil pressure, but also because of the fact that the dry sumps eliminate, basically eliminate the PCV system. Mm -hmm. and, and the PCV system like can be really problematic on the EJ platform even if you have intervention methods, inter oil separation and so forth. And I'm, my sense, I guess, what is your take on this? My sense is that issues with the PCV system are more to blame for engine failures than, in, than issues with the oil pressure system, like the oil pump system. I wouldn't blame the PCV, PCV specifically crankcase ventilation. Okay, crankcase ventilation. So, so I yeah. would say if you, uh, yes, no, it's in the same volume as your, you know, your oil system, your wet slush. Right. But right. I would say oil slush, I would blame it on the PCV system, right? Okay. So yeah. if you're going to have oil slush in the cylinder head, which everybody, <laughs> anyone with an EJ205 who's taken a really, really, really long, like cloverleaf exit on an interstate is a very spirited thing, might have spun a rod bearing. Raise your hand. Right. Um, right. Right. And again, I knew that engine was going anyway, so I didn't really care. <laughs> but uh, yeah, came out the other side of that with, uh, you know, cousin Rodney just knocking away. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, you, you learn. And one of the things is I think a lot of it in the OEM system is keeping the oil where you want the oil to be. Yeah, which is around. So if you had a wet sump, if you had a wet yeah. sump where you knew you could keep the oil in the pan, would you be concerned with it? Not if you knew that oil much. would never leave yeah. the pan and go into your head, you just have to wait to come out of the corner for whatever valve train oil you had to go back into the pan. So right. would you be concerned? Not as much, not as much. Right. What would yeah. be your concern at that point? I'm just curious. If I knew PCV that the oil system was in should the be pan. fine. So, so ventilation system should still be fine. Mm -hmm. Nothing should be bubbling. Nothing be puking oil. You're not going to have, you know, three quarts of oil slosh in that head because you're in a high G turn. And I guess right. for most people don't realize, you know, when, when you're taking a turn, say, here's your Subaru, right? Yeah. So you're going to take a one G turn. You're essentially at a 45 degree angle. Right. So your pans down here, all that oil is just going in here into your head. Right. So. It, well, I think. Once you, once you know that the pan is going to have oil and the pickup is going to be covered, then I think the focus would turn to how the oil gets to the engine and goes through the engine versus trying to keep it in the pan. Keep it in the pan right. is that's that's job number one. Yeah. And that's I guess with the dry sump, that's the advantage is you don't have the worry about the oil getting into the engine because it's stored in this external tank. Right. So you know that you're always going to have that flow. And so on a similar note, and you hit on it, is where people say that they have you know, a lack of oil flow. 
or, or that they had starvation. How do you know? How many people run right. data fast enough and actually log it and look at actual data to say that they do have starvation or do not have starvation? Right. Yeah. So it's almost like data logging. Like data logging is one of those big missing, like that, that is the data grand is power for race yeah. cars. Yeah. Yeah. Not knowledge is power. Yeah. Data power. It's one of the old, uh, got mine on the shelf somewhere over there. I can't think of the name of the author, but yeah. Yeah. It's one of those little textbooks of mine, but well, yeah. And when you're, if, if you're doing a teardown and you've had a failure, you can see, you can see the signs of wear, you can see the damage, you can see the signs of wear, mm -hmm. but it's like you, you have to kind of, you're doing a forensic analysis, but you kind of have to guess, well, where is the chicken? Where's the egg? What, right. what, how well, do these things relate? So, so the other thing is if you're actually tracking your bearings and watching things and see how things are running, you'll have signs. So say for instance, you took, you know, oil analysis, sent it out, saw that you had excessive bearing wear, say, hey, you know what? Yeah, had starvation issues that I thought I saw in this last plot. You know, for most people, I recommend doing an XY scatter plot to check your oil. Mm -hmm. um, and also do that scatter plot at the same kind of temperature. I really do like thermostatically controlled oil systems. So, you know, you're at least at the same rough operating temperature. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really cold and thick when I just did a quick pull to check something at home, make sure it was fine versus I'm at the track and now I'm up, you know, 40 degrees in oil temperature. Um, mm -hmm. That doesn't really help you a lot because your oil pressure will automatically be down just because it's so hot. The sky is down, yeah. you know. So, yeah. so say for instance you had a hot engine and you know down the straight you're doing a couple of pulls, just ripping, you know, grabbing a few gears, get up fifth, sixth, well, six, fifth and sixth if you're, you know, time attack car some good power. But you know, mm -hmm. you've got a good X Y scatter plot. You can pull in and see where your oil pressure is, and you have this beautiful curve as your well, I'll go the other way. So as you know, RPMs increasing, oil pressure is increasing, and right. as you start going through the rest of the track, you'll start seeing these points that drop out. You get a couple little flyers here and there yep. where you're getting it drop out and go, all right, yeah, you're having some amount of starvation or it's aeration. It's not necessarily you're starving. Right. It could also be that you're now pulling from oil that's so low in the tank because not enough is in the actual I should take pan. I'll say pan. Right. That there's not enough in the pan that you're now you're starting to pull that upper layer, which is aeration, which is where air and oil are now essentially kind of a foam, a froth. Right. Think of a latte on top of your oil. Yeah. Um, and the thing is getting aeration out of oil is really hard to do. It mm -hmm. takes time. It takes mechanical separation. Usually you'll spin it in like a race engine that has, you know, a serious like endurance engine type application or, you know, Formula One engine where I'll, I'll say it's endurance because it has to run six Grand Prix. Yeah. Um, but you go ahead and take this into consideration then. For something that's just a track car, you know, run HPDEs, don't think that's a real thing. If you're a time attack car that's just going to go run some sprints. Maybe. Probably, probably but... not a real issue. Like, kind of, you know, kind of like a street mod car, not a thing. A limited car, absolutely. I'd try some that because how, how does arrow arrow plays into this? But but can you can you talk on maybe how arrow plays into it? Into which part? Well, like monitoring the oil pressure and maybe going to dry some because of the the quartering loads. I would so I if, would guess. Uh, so if you're gonna yeah. so you're essentially if I have more cornering G's is what you mean by yeah. how arrow plays yeah. in. Yeah, it'll it'll try and sling that oil further out. <laughs> right. Um. Right. You, you know, going back to here's your Subaru, right? So uh, yep. you know. It'll, 45 degrees, I'd actually have to do the math on it real quick, but say TGs, yeah. you're at like uh, 66 degrees now. And, right. and you, and so your, your pan's still here. It's really easy trying to just push all that oil on over because that's just where yeah. your new gravity, right? So you have two yep. Gs that are slinging you outward and only one G pulling it down, right? So Yeah, and that's, I think, when people try and add aero or, and big wings, big splitters and get a lot more grip and, and increase quartering speeds and stuff like that, that's one of those aspects that, it can just it can just get overlooked so easily that like you're you're really right. putting a lot more stress on your oiling system because th those that grip is also stressing the oiling. Right. There's a correlation there. Thanks for tuning in. To hear the whole conversation, click below for the full episode of this podcast, or tune in every week on iTunes or Spotify. If you like these episodes, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel because your support is what makes all of this possible. As always, this show is brought to you by Flatirons Tuning, your premier source for any Subaru, OEM, or aftermarket parts. Check out our website at flatironstuning.com, and as always, stay tuned with Flatirons Tuning.